Okay, guys, so here's the deal. Social security disability benefits have a different standard of approach to what the government has to do for you in comparison to veterans benefits. So social security benefits, SSDI, SSI benefits, right? Versus VA-based disability benefits. I'm gonna to read to you some case law quotes to kind of get us raveled up and get us excited about this real quick. Here we go. I'm using one of my favorite books right here. <clears throat> this, so you guys know, it's the VA Handbook for Veterans and Advocates, How to File for VA Benefits and Fill Your Claim. Really amazing book. Isn't just a fluff piece. Let's get right to the case law <laughs> options here. All right, so first one. This is from Coomer v. Peak. The VA disability compensation system is not meant to be a trap for the unwary or a stratagem. I love that word. That's such a good word. Stratagem. I was playing Monopoly when my stratagem. Okay, anyways. Or a stratagem to deny compensation to a veteran who has a valid claim. Next quote. Holton v. Uh, Shinseki. The Department of Veteran Affairs is required to reject a disability claim if the claimant fails to put forth sufficient evidence showing that he suffered an injury or incurred a disease during service. So that's the other side. The, hey, if you can't say where, when, how, then they have to reject it. Next quote. Barrett v. Nicholson. The government's interest in veterans' cases is, n is not that it shall win. Right? The VA is saying it's not our job to try and win these things against you. But rather... That justice shall be done. That all veterans so entitled receive the benefits due to them. So this is the counterpoint to the prior case law quote of, hey, we want to make sure that we go out of our way to make sure we're absolutely certain that this is a valid claim and that this person gets their benefits. Next one, Hodge v. West. In the context of veterans' benefits, where the system of awarding compensation is so uniquely pro-claimant, more pro-claimant than Social Security disability benefits. It's a more pro-claimant system than the civilian side. The importance of systemic fairness and the appearance of fairness carries great weight. So what they're saying here is it's kind of like how a judge has to be. They have to appear to be fair and they have to be fair in their adjudications, okay? Next quote from <clears throat> Henderson v. Shinseki. The contrast between ordinary civil litigation and the system that Congress created for the adjudication of veteran benefit claims could hardly be more dramatic. The latter having laws that place a thumb on the scale in the veteran's favor. So what they're saying is, and in law, we talk about scales, scales of justice, right? There's some blind lady and she's, you know, she's holding these scales, you know, she's blind. She can't see which one is going up because it's, it's based off of the weight of the evidence being good, that this will be worth more and this will win. Well, same kind of gig is that when we talk about uh, claims in this system, the bottom line is we talk about essentially <clears throat> if a claim or a system has a slight advantage, we talk about a thumb on the scale, right? The tip of a thumb on the scale of justice. And that's where that whole idea comes from. Now, this is directly from the VA's website. Uh, what's the duty to assist? Okay, so we've talked about case law. We've established that there's a duty there. What's the duty to assist? This means that we're required to help you gather evidence. Actually, this, uh, and I'll get that. I'll find the law a little later. There's a specific law where they gave you, and it's, it hasn't been around forever either. It's relatively recent compared to how long VA benefits have been around. But this means that we're required to help you gather evidence to support your claim for VA benefits. We'll make a reasonable effort to help you get these types of evidence. Number one, VA medical records. Number two, military service records. Number three, other types of federal records. Number four, private medical records like reports from a non-VA hospital or from your health care providers. Now, you notice they didn't mention in that like police reports, your old school records, stuff like that. They, they Sometimes there's an option where they go for that stuff, but usually the attorney will go ahead and obtain that. You'll need to tell us what type of records you want us to get for you, the dates of the records and where we can get them. To help us decide your claim, we must also ask you to have a claim exam. That's your CMP exam. So in the disability world, that's the same thing as like a CEME, Consultative Examination Medical Expert Appointment. 
except in VA land, it's called a CMP. Okay. Or we may request a medical opinion of someone. Okay. How we define a reasonable effort. So let me go back to the definition of what a duty to assist is. Okay. That means that we're required to help you gather evidence to support your claim for VA benefits. We'll make a reasonable effort. Like how do you know what I mean? Like a re, what, what does that mean? A reasonable effort to help you get these types of evidence. Reasonable effort. For VA, military, and other types of federal records, we'll continue to make requests until we get the records you need. So that's just for the military or the federal records. That's not for like, you know, private records, private doctors, things like that. We'll stop trying only if we're reasonably sure the records don't exist, right? So if they write back and say, hey, the records were burnt up in this fire. Uh, Diane Fernandez, howdy, howdy. Very cool. Thank you for the $5 donation. Super love it. That's awesome. Very, very cool. So um, love the little sandcastle. Oh, that's awesome. So with this said, uh, they will keep trying for those records that are part of the military in some way, fashion, or form, VA records, et cetera. For private records, however, we'll make at least one follow-up request to try to get your records. If we can't get the records you need, we'll tell you why we're having trouble and if you need to do anything. So what they're saying is, hey, they'll go ahead and try once. They'll try again, but after that, they'll reach out to you and say, here's our problem. Here's the issue we're running into. Okay. Next one, permission to access your private medical records. Okay, so basically that talks about the PACT Act, uh, things that you need to understand. All right. All right, now let's go into this. What's a duty to assist error? Okay, that's important here. Straight from their website. If we don't make a reasonable effort to help you get the evidence you need for your initial claim or supplemental claim, that's a duty to assist error. Sometimes this type of error means that we didn't get medical records you told us about, or it could mean that we didn't request a claim exam or medical opinion you needed. That's a tricky one because the weight of the evidence, was the evidence provided enough with what you suggested, your private physicians, the veteran affairs physicians? Did they need an additional CMP exam to throw on top of that? That gets a little tricky, okay? We may find this type of error when we're reviewing the decision you received on a claim because you requested a higher level review or board appeal. So what they're saying is they'll catch this stuff down the line during the appeals. But bottom line is, you know, during the initial appeal period, that's where the mistakes are going to be made. And then you're going to have to know enough to go ahead and see them and then, you know, complain about them in the higher level appellate stages. Okay. What happens if we find a duty to assist error? If we find an error during a higher level review, we'll close the review and open a new claim to gather the missing evidence. We'll also send you a letter to tell you the steps we'll take to fix this error. Then we'll help you get the missing evidence and decide your case based on this new evidence. So they create basically a new claim. Okay. If we find an error during a board appeal, higher level, right? We'll close the appeal and send your case back, also called a remand, to a regional office to gather the missing information. Okay. So that's how that works. Um, They'll also send you a letter, tell you the steps, what you do, how to fix the error, you know, whether or not they were able to get the evidence thereafter, et cetera. Now that's good. But what you also have to understand, I think this is incredibly important, is that at the end of the day, knowing the evidence standards is very important. So let's go back to this over here. You need to know your burden of proof versus standards of proof. Now in the VA, because remember in, in most law, those are interchangeable, but in the VA, they're not. Okay. So let's go through this. The VA claims the burden of proof refers to the veteran's legal duty to produce evidence and persuade the VA about their claim. Okay, so that's the burden of proof. That's the duty that the veteran has. Okay, now the standard of proof refers to the degree of confidence held by the VA. How confident is the VA in what you, uh, you know, a uh, 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 a veteran has provided that a veteran has proven the assertion made by their claim, right? So you, the veteran claim this, I'm giving you this evidence. And then they go through the burden of, okay, here's all everything that I've got. Here's my evidence to persuade you to find me, you know, hundred percent PNT, TDIU, whatever. Next, then we look into basically the standard of proof from the VA. And that is the degree of confidence held by the VA. Now, standards of proof. 
a lot of you guys know the, the civilian or the criminal side, right? The preponderance of the evidence, you know, that's it's greater than 50%. You got clear and convincing evidence. Uh, that's basically your like 51% to 99%. Um, but preponderance is right around that 50% mark. Beyond all reasonable doubt is 100%. There's no question. It's absolute. It is definitive, right? The evidence is absolute. You know, we know that he was the one with the steak knife, you know, in the kitchen who did the deed, right? Okay, so that would be your beyond a reasonable doubt. But in VA law, there are different standards. The different standards are the following, okay? Number one, affirmative evidence to the contrary, okay? The fact is unlikely and the evidence against the matter is of greater weight. So what they're saying is it actually looks like what the evidence is showing that it's not what you're saying. It's it's the other thing, right? Okay. This standard is the opposite of the preponderance of the evidence standard. Cool. Okay, good, good, good. So bottom line is, um, you know, that looks like uh, a situation where you're not going to do well. You're not going to, you're not going to have successful evidence with that. Okay. Next one, uh, relative equipoise. Evidence must persuade the decision maker that the fact is as likely as not. Now, this is your this is your standard in VA law. What this is is your 51% to potentially uh, you know higher, uh, or actually it's it's no sorry, the equipoise is basically it's 50%, 50%. It, it could go either way. It's one of those things where uh and the, the terms you want to use here are this: that the fact is as likely as is not. So it's right in that 50% mark. It's it could go this way. It could go that way, et cetera, right? But that's the standard that they use for VA personnel to prove their claim. Next one, preponderance of the evidence. Uh, the greater weight of evidence is that the fact exists. The fact is more likely than not. Clear and convincing evidence. The fact finder has reasonable certainty of the truth of the fact. This is a higher standard of proof than having to find a fact is more likely than not. So we're getting closer to that higher percentage of likelihood that that evidence is absolutely certain. Clear and unmistakable evidence. This evidence must establish the fact without question. This is more of your like beyond reasonable kind of area up in the sky of like it's absolutely certain. Okay. Now with that said, and this is an important thing to understand. For veterans, the minimum burden, this is straight from the book, of proof needed to prevail on a claim for benefits is called the benefit of the doubt standard or the reasonable doubt rule. For the reasonable doubt rule to apply, right, the evidence must persuade the claims examiner that the assertive fact is as likely true as it is not true. So in terms of percentages, the benefit of the doubt applies where there's approximately a balance of positive and negative evidence of 50%. So it's that like I'm a little teapot and it's sitting right here. It's right in the 50% zone. It's not bad. It's not good. It's right in the 50% zone. That's what the veterans have to prove to prove their claim. Now, the ironic thing is that the VA, and this is another huge benefit to, to the veterans over the civilians, the VA has to prove something that is essentially a higher level, a higher standard to go against you. So the VA, when they want to deny a claim, they have to prove a preponderance of the evidence. So they have a higher standard to go ahead and deny the claim. Or they call the majority of the evidence uh, must be against the veteran's claim. And for that to occur, and if it does occur, right, then the claim can be denied. So when a preponderance of the evidence is against the claim, the claim is denied. Uh, when the preponderance, preponderance of evidence, of uh, positive evidence favors the veteran, the claim is granted, okay? But the claim can still be granted at this benefit of the doubt area, okay? This preponderance of negative or unfavorable evidence is known as affirmative evidence to the contrary, in terms of percentages, affirmative evidence to the contrary means greater than 50% of the evidence is against the veteran. As noted by the M21-1 manual, affirmative evidence to the contrary is the opposite of the preponderance standard. So for veterans to really prove their claim, they need this benefit of the doubt or what's essentially called your, your, uh, you know, um, your relative um, equipoise, right? Whereas the higher standard is the V to prove you wrong. So the VA has like this, you know, more difficult time, this higher level of evidence. Now, I understand some of the VA people will be like, yeah, but it doesn't seem like that because they get the advantage and they're the ones who make the decision and yada, yada. And I get that. But the true standards of this benefit of the doubt 
is what you need to achieve. It's that just as likely as not. It's that 50% right in the middle of this balancing of evidence, okay? Here, let me read to you this part because it's important. This is more on the benefit of the doubt standard, okay? Okay, the benefit of the doubt is the minimum burden of proof required to prevail on a disability claim. The VA is considering a claim. It will give positive and negative values to different pieces of evidence. When there's approximate balance of positive and negative evidence, a unique standard, the benefit of the doubt, applies and the veteran is entitled to relief. As described by the CABC, the benefit of the doubt is, as, is akin to the Major League Baseball rule. The tie goes to the runner. So if you guys don't know what that means, you know, basically, if, if there's a tie, then the benefit of the doubt goes to the runner. In this case, if there's a tie between the evidence, the evidence doesn't look good, the evidence looks good, then the you know benefit goes to the veteran. When there is a tie between negative and positive evidence, the VA should grant the claim even when uncertainty exists. VA has a duty to give veterans the benefit of the doubt. Okay. And so the bottom line is understanding this whole, what is this, you know, veterans duty to assist? That's the real crux of it. They'll go get your evidence. They'll help you out. They'll go ahead and give you a better legal standard of likelihood to be approved, even better than the one that they have, than they have to deny you. Now, why does this exist? Well, it exists because the problem is veterans come out of military service. They have a problem. And, you know, the, the, the ultimate result is how likely are you to expect these individuals to be successful in representing themselves or even finding a representative, finding an attorney to assist with this? Now, as you know, attorneys are not allowed to help with initial VA claims, right? Only the appeals thereafter. So the interesting thing is that, yeah, you could get a VSO, you could try it on your own, et cetera, et cetera. But the bottom line here is this. When these individuals, these veterans come out of the military and they're, you know, not in the best shape, they're trying to figure out their new way. Maybe they have mental impairments. Maybe they have physical impairments. The goal is to give them a slight advantage that will allow them to have a better shot, if you will, of getting approved for, you know, disability benefits through the VA. And that's where this whole, like, that's where the public policy comes from. That's why they have a better likelihood, a higher standard uh, of being able to get access to those veteran disability benefits than the civilians do. And the reason why is they just serve for the country. And if they're applying for disability benefits, whether it's, you know, PTSD, anxiety, depression, could be a back issue, could be a heart issue, could be a respiratory issue, whatever. The point is, you know, there's no traditional workers comp system that is akin to what we have in the civilian market. So the government has to go ahead and balance that and assist with those individuals having a way, a means to actually pass through this system, which is awesome, which is very, very good. So I hope that this helped uh, basically people understand a little bit more about the VA system. I think some of the questions some of you will likely have, well, how do we know when the evidence is teetering on this system? And the reality is if they use a point system towards their evidence and, you know, is the point system going to be perfect with the 50-50? Very, very unusual, very unlikely. Uh, but the reality is, is that you can argue to go ahead and create a, a potential, uh, you know, probability in your likelihood based off of those point values that are given. Now, at the end of the day, uh, I just want to note one thing. The main thing VA, you know, veterans uh, have issues with is that when they get out of the military, they go to the VA, they say to the VA, hey, what do I apply for? I'm having issues with this impairment. I'm having issues with this disability. I'm having issues with this problem. And then unfortunately, a lot of the VA, they'll just hand them some giant packet and say, here, go figure it out. Uh, here's how you apply. Go pick a VSO, blah, blah, blah. One big thing that they do not do is apply for SSDI benefits immediately. So a lot of these veterans will you know, basically go through the process of, you know, they won't work for three years, they won't work for five years, and then all of a sudden, poof, they run out of quarters of coverage for their SSDI benefits. This is not good because this is a stackable check. Could it be an extra 1500 2000 2500 3000 3500 et cetera, a month on top of the benefits they already get for VA. It is not incorrect to say that VA benefits with their stackable counterpart of civilian benefits are incredible because you could serve, has, have an impairment, and then basically go live your life without working so long as you can go ahead and you know take care of yourself, et cetera. Uh, or, or you could, through the VA, have somebody else come to your house and take care of you. That's another thing that I should do a video on, which is that the VA 
has all these incredible programs, uh, in-house treatments, you know, transportation options that Medicare and Medicaid don't have at those same levels. So I'll do another video on basically program accommodations that come after being found disabled because a lot of people don't realize what's out there. Um, final note when it comes to this is that uh, ultimately at the end of the day, as I'm sure many who are watching this video, the whole gig is basically a PNT or a TDIU. Um, what is incredibly important is to realize that when you fight for this, you have to create a consistent record. And a lot of the VA individuals tend to have an ego. I can prove myself and do myself and achieve this and da, 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 da. And that's fine. Some of the civilians also have that. You know, I used to hear 10, 15 years ago from the civilians, hey, um, you know, I don't, I'm only applying for this because I really need it. Or I've never asked the government for anything until now, yada, yada. And there was almost like this embarrassment attached to having to need some sort of financial assistance. And the reason why from the civilian side was that in America, people used to uh, have a more capitalist oriented logic, right? And then what happened was you had everything that was more like, you know, capitalism, Republican, everything slid this way. So, you know, the, the Republicans of now, of today are like kind of in the middle and the Democrats are just way, way farther off that way. So the mentality with that changed. So a lot of people who are like, well, I want to work and earn my future. Now, a lot more of those people are in the middle of like, well, what's available? What can I get? And I don't blame them. I surely don't blame them. The economy is total crap right now. Uh, and you're about to see truly incredible, unprecedented uh, situations going between uh, the two potential presidential candidates of 2024. Um, you know, I don't know if you saw the news, but it uh, looks like Georgia just released some information that's some incredibly bad news for Trump. Point is, um, and I mean, I don't know, Trump may turn into a Mandela, you know, uh, situation for the United States. But the point is, um, when it comes to VA benefits and SSDI benefits, please, 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 please. The moment you file for your VA benefits, immediately go file for your civilian benefits because you don't know how, how many calls I get from veterans that ask me, okay, cool, am I good? And I say, you're not good because you haven't worked for 10 years and you've run out of quarters of coverage and you can't go on SSI because you're getting too much VA benefits. And that sucks because you're basically telling somebody who's fought for the country and many of the ones that call me were on the front lines that the system is set up in a way that punishes them because they couldn't work and didn't know. And it's, it's not good. Guys, I will be uh, at the next video uh, and, uh, I'm really, really excited. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Late Troit said, when can we start paying for the one hour consultation? Okay. So here's the deal on the one hour consultation. We did a prototype one and it was good. I was getting the feeling of it. The person was, you know, going through it. Um, I asked him at the end, I said, look, like, how did they go? How, did you enjoy it? We spent like an hour and 15 minutes on the phone. Cause I wanted to like, learn, like, did he enjoy it? Was it, you know, where he gathered, he had like a 30 point list of what he had to do. So like he, he said he felt overwhelmed. He said he felt like um, he wanted more time and would have wanted to pay for another hour. He said he felt like basically, you know, it was just, it was too much information in too short a period. So um, I, I don't think that's a bad thing, but I think that one of the problems is that during this hour, the person, so the way that one went was like for 30 ish minutes, I got story mode. They told me what was going on with their story and how it worked. And at the end of it, I just started hammering them with bullet points. And then I would ask them questions and more bullet points. And by the end of it, they had a giant tree of like what path they had to follow if certain things occurred and where things would go. I'm new to this whole, you just hire me for an hour thing because I'm used to representing people and just doing a bunch of the stuff for them because obviously I have a staff that works with them. But for those claimants where I can't do that, I think this hour is a good option where it's you know, the 250 bucks per hour. Um, I'm going to finalize the contract after doing one more video and then I have to go outside and weed whack. But, um, uh, basically if you're on the list, uh, over the next couple of days, you're probably going to get an email or get a call and we're going to schedule a time for you. And it's simple. The way it works is you got to pay it a day ahead of time. You got to sign the contract a day ahead of time. Uh, and all you do is you sign the contract. It's one page or you fax it, email, or just take a photo of it, send it back to me. I store it in a file and then we get rolling. All right. Um, I will catch you guys a little bit later. You have a wonderful, wonderful day. And uh, I'm going to be doing one more video. And the next video will be the 
uh, five extreme difficulty hearing questions that you might hear at a social security disability hearing. So stick around for that. Please remember to like, subscribe, and leave five star or leave a review if you like. You can leave whatever review you want. Um, you go to Disability Resolution Florida or Disability Resolution Law Firm, and you uh, go onto Google and then click write a review. I love waking up to see the five stars. Um, we have some really cool videos coming out in the not too distant future. Uh, that includes the kitchen from the house next door that we are working on. That's going to be split up into multiple videos of that restoration because that restoration of that room was huge. I will catch you guys a little bit later. I will see you in five minutes. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. And uh, remember, the next one is on the five really extreme difficulty hearing questions that you're likely to hear. And I'll give you an analysis on them. I'll catch you a little bit later in uh, five minutes. All right. Bye-bye, guys. Bye-bye.